welcome everyone uh, to the uh, first uh, webinar uh, that we're holding uh, as CCQM uh, on the topic of ensuring the reliability of measurements in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, that's the agenda that we run through and uh, I will allow uh, our, my colleagues, uh, uh, um, Jim Huggett, who's chair of the Nucleic Acid, Acid Working Group, and uh, Jerry Millinson, uh, who's chair of the Protein Analysis Working Group in CCQM, uh, to introduce the, uh, the webinar and the speakers in the second. Um, I was asked just to say a few words to start with, uh, just a little bit about the BIPM and CCQM, because we have a few visitors amongst us, including the speakers, uh, just to say uh, what our background is. Um, so obviously I'm representing the BIPM, which is an intergovernmental organization for metrology and uh, is established by the meeting convention through which our member states act on measurement on matters related uh, to measurement science and measurement standards. And so we're a rather uh, old organization established in 1875, but still going strong. And uh, the META convention has now over a hundred uh, state parties uh, linked to it as including state parties and economies who associates or members. So uh, if we look at our committee structure, we have a number of committees dealing with various aspects of measurement science in different areas. And obviously here we are meeting as CCQM. So it's the CCQ, it's the consultative committee that deals with issues related to measurement standards and measurement comparability in the field of chemistry and biology. Uh, but we should, we also have joint committees and one of those is very closely linked to that area, which is the Joint Committee for Traceability and Laboratory Medicine. And we have some representatives uh, from those organizations attending today, very much linked to the diagnostics field. So we actually have two committees of, uh, for whom this is of great interest. But today we're holding this meeting underneath the banner of the CCQM and for National Metrology Institutes who are active in this area. So the CCQM is, is a consultative committee. It's responsible for developing, improving and documenting the equivalence of uh, national standards. And we, we mean in that case, certified reference materials and reference methods for chemical and biological measurements. It strives to progress the state of art of chemical and biological measurement science and to work with global stakeholders to promote and increase the impact of metrology and chemistry and biology. And we have three major objectives, uh, to progress the state of the art in chemical and biological measurement science, to reach out to new and established stakeholders, and this is very much part of that sort of work, and obviously a lot of our comparison work uh, at a laboratory level, looking at the global comparability of chemical and biological measurements. So uh, for those who are active in this area, we have a, a well-developed uh, agreement arrangement, uh, which has been running since 1999, uh, for looking at the equivalence of uh, measurement standards, reference materials and reference methods, and mutual recognition of calibration certificates underneath the CIPM mutual recognition agreement. And that is based upon doing technical work to assess the equivalence of measurement capabilities in chemistry and biology. And in essence, uh, we call those uh, interlaboratory studies key comparisons and we've been running a number of those in many areas including the diagnostics field and so some of these are examples very much in clinical chemistry area that the CCQM has been running really for some time. Uh, we are evolving in our needs and responses to needs and of course one of the areas which has been evolving rapidly over the years is that of looking at uh, increased focus on measurements in the biology area and the bioanalysis working group five years ago expanded to cover three areas uh, those of cells nucleic acids and proteins and very much that's the link uh, that their interest in this activity is very much one of the reasons for the uh, webinar today so uh, that's the structure of the webinar. I won't go through that because I'll leave that to my colleagues to explain uh, the goals uh, of the webinar and, uh, and just overview, uh, present our speakers and what they'll be describing today. Um, and I will just leave you uh, with a few uh, uh, rules or etiquette for the meeting. So uh, you will be able to see the plenary, uh, the participants, sorry, the uh, plenary speakers uh, as they come and give their presentations. Uh, Participants can write questions using the Q&A function. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A function. Please type in questions uh, that you would like answered. And uh, our group of panelists will look at those questions. We may not have time to answer all questions, but the, uh, the panelists will pick a few of the questions. Um, so uh, uh, Jeremy, Jonathan, uh, 
and Jim will be picking a few of those questions after each speaker to ask those questions to the speaker. Uh, for the panellists, to avoid any background noise, I'd ask them to use mute when not presenting or answering questions. And uh, so with that, that's my brief introduction and a few instructions on how we're going to run the meeting. And it's a pleasure for me to hand over to Jim and Jeremy to introduce the webinar. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, uh, can everybody hear me? Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to give a very brief um, overview of the plan uh, of the series of these workshops and then introduce two of our speakers and then Jeremy will introduce the um, following two. Um, Robert, I don't know if you want to put the agenda up. Yep, I'm just, just doing that. So we can touch it. Thank you very much. Um, and just, just to clarify, the speakers will speak and then there'll be questions to the speakers after those, um, after their individual presentations. So just a little bit of background. Um, the, the CCQM, we, we convened oh, about six weeks ago um, to discuss, you know, activities that were ongoing with the CCQM in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was decided that a series of workshops was needed to, to look at how our community um, could could respond and in ensuring the reliability of measurements in, in response to COVID-19 pandemic and ultimately um, future challenges and what we could learn as, as a community from this. And so we have three workshops essentially planned. Today's workshop one, which is very much an information gathering uh, exercise from external experts and scientists to inform our community among uh, CCQM on, on activities that are already going on um, in, in the response. And then workshop two, which will also be a webinar, which is planned for the, the um, for October time, and um, which will be looking at reporting very much our, on the progress that National Measurement Institutes um, have, have conducted within COVID-19 activities uh, amongst CCQM experts and, and look at further gathering of information from uh, external experts. And then the plan, um, uh, activities or, or situations be allowing will be uh, in, in April 2021 for us to have a, a third workshop at the BIPM based in Paris um, and, and look at you know technical discussions on standardization challenges and progress for measurement in response to the COVID-19. So kind of come up with the roadmap for the future roles of National Measurement Institute activities in this area and, and establish how our community can support those who we're going to hear from today in, in, in responding to these challenges that occur. So we're very, very fortunate to have four speakers um, with us today. Um, and I'll just touch on the first to the first two speakers, uh, Professor Jacob Marangilan and Professor Heinz Zeichart. I'm very fortunate to have been able to work with them over the last oof, five plus years, I think, between the two of them. Um, they are both, uh, outstanding scientists um, and, and uh, outstanding, how outstanding there is only really parried by uh, their humility. Um, Jacob is going to be speaking on diagnostics um, from a me measurement to policy and Jacob is a, is a clinician um, and the microbiologist but also expert in public health um, and uh, one of those few, in, few, few medics who gets genomics um, but really uh, is a brilliant, brilliant scientist based in Ben Gurion University of the Negev based in, in Israel. Jacob is also the program director for the uh, European Congress of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, ICMED. So um, has a wide, and a wide, wide network and, and, and a great expert in this area. And we're very, very fortunate. Um, and then Heinz Zeichart, I've known for quite a while working on a number of um, um, projects. Um, very fortunate, uh, the European Union funded projects out of Euromet and the MRP. Um, looking at um, viral measurement primarily. Um, and Heinz Zeichart is uh, an expert in, in viral diagnostics and standardization. He is uh, the CEO of um, GBD, forgive me Heinz, I'm not going to pronounce, try to pronounce the German description of GBD. And he's also involved with the IQVD and is a professor of virology at Charité. Um, and Heinz is an expert on management of laboratory medicine and, and organizer of INSTAND and WHO quality assessments. And Heinz and his team have done an outstanding job in response to the SARS-CoV-2 measurements and the COVID-19 pandemic in, in driving one of the first proficiency schemes in April, um, which was wide ranging and, and, and multi-country. And so we are very, very fortunate to have Jacob and Heinz and um, I'm, I'm very grateful to them to be giving us their time to present. Uh, I will now hand over to Jeremy who will introduce the, um, the following two speakers. 
Thanks, Jim. Uh, so on the protein side, we're a little bit less advanced uh, than, say, the DNA. Our, our, our groups are working mostly on uh, peptides, working up to smaller proteins. Uh, but with the pandemic, uh, that's essentially turned all our planning upside, upside down. And uh, now we're trying to focus on larger proteins, uh, of the antibodies, uh, and many NMIs are building capacity in this area uh, to respond to the pandemic. Uh, so we really look forward to the two presentations uh, this morning on the protein side. Uh, firstly, we have Professor Michael, uh, Michael uh, Neumeyer of the medical faculty at Mannheim, who will provide highlights from an interlab study in Germany. And we'll discuss uh, measurement challenges such as uh, antigen standardization. Uh, following that, we have Michael, uh, Michael uh, uh, Drabat of the National Microbial National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, Canada, and he will discuss assessment of different assay platforms and their validation along with potential correlation to immunity. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to uh, Jacob. Okay. So Good Jacob, afternoon. Like to share. Yeah. Good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and also for the nice invitation. I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy and, and delighted to, uh, to participate in, uh, in this event. I will try to share my screen. Okay. So, uh, so my topic today, as already mentioned, is uh, COVID diagnostics from measurement to policy. And what I will try to do in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes is uh, to give an overview of how I see the, the range of uh, COVID-19 diagnostics and uh, what are the uh, challenges that we're experiencing, uh, both from the uh, analytic, but also the operational aspects and, and how uh, diagnostics could uh, inform our public health policy. And I think that could set the scene uh, very nicely to the next, uh, to the next speakers. So, uh, I mean, we're hearing about COVID-19 uh, like several hours a day, uh, but still it's rapidly uh, changing and the numbers uh, uh, keep getting updated. Uh, so these are uh, the curves from, from just the other day, uh, showing a worldwide picture. Of course, one cannot see every country uh, individually, but uh, we can definitely uh, see that in the, the majority of countries at the moment, uh, after this uh, sort of logarithmic uh, phase uh, with a doubling time of cases of every day or uh, every uh, few days, uh, in, in most countries uh, uh, there is some flattening of the curve. Uh, still some, some countries are, are witnessing uh, Increasing, uh, increasing rates. Some countries uh, have uh, seemed to, to have gone out of the, the first uh, wave, so to speak, and are now witnessing an exacerbation. So it's definitely uh, a very dynamic uh, situation. And uh, one of the things that uh, are, are not always very clear when data are, are uh, shown publicly is, is how the diagnostics actually influence uh, the curves. And for us as diagnostics people, it's quite clear that the more tests are being done, uh, we increase the chances of uh, infected cases uh, being captured. And so uh, the, the use of diagnostics and the incidents go uh, hand in hand. And if we look at uh, deaths. So uh, this is of course uh, a very similar trend because we have uh, a certain proportion of cases who unfortunately die of the disease. Uh, uh, the death rate uh, still differs between different countries. Uh, 
Um, and, and one of the main reasons why we see uh, different mortality rates between uh, geographic localities is also diagnostics. I mean, of course, uh, you may have heard there are different theories about the, the virus uh, having been mutated and weakened and so forth. Uh, but uh, definitely the amount of testing that we're doing influences the denominator. And the more tests that we do, the more cases and asymptomatic cases that we uh, identify. And I will go back to this uh, slightly later. And of course, if we increase the denominator, then this dilutes the, the cases of uh, tests, which of course these are uh, hard uh, or ground truth, if you like. So uh, this one of the reasons why we have uh, been seeing different uh, mortality rates. Of course, there are many other uh, epidemiological and clinical aspects. I will not go to that, but I'm, I'm just trying to uh, highlight uh, why diagnostics are so important, uh, not only in, in identifying the individual uh, COVID-19 case, but also in, in actually portraying the, the, the entire dynamics of, of this uh, uh, pandemic. So focusing on, on the tests, um, um, the, the uh, tests for COVID-19 have been introduced uh, quite early. So already in January, after the, uh, the first genomic sequences of the virus became available, several groups uh, from Germany and other European countries and also uh, North America uh, have designed uh, in silico and then validated in vitro uh, qPCR tests. And uh, there is an entire range of diagnostics that are becoming more and more relevant. And I will also mention that uh, slightly later. Uh, but these, uh, uh, these illustrations, uh, they refer to uh, PCR, which is the, the most commonly used uh, test at the moment. And uh, what is very clear uh, is that we see, first of all, uh, significant differences between uh, geographic localities and, and different countries. And that, of course, uh, relates to capacity, also relates to, uh, uh, to local policies. Uh, but uh, clearly, there is an increase in the volume of tests being done. And I think we've uh, already uh, passed uh, a, a million tests being done uh, on a daily basis uh, worldwide. Uh, the numbers are much higher than that. And, and this is really an unprecedented volume of tests, uh, especially during uh, uh, such a short time period and, and a novel test. So, I mean, before January, we did not have uh, a, a SARS-CoV-2 specific test. So this is an enormous achievement for the diagnostics uh, community, having been able to um, uh, develop uh, so many uh, reliable tests and, and deploy them. And uh, definitely uh, the availability of those tests influences much uh, our ability to, to handle uh, this pandemic. Um, but of course, uh, testing policies uh, differ, and, and this is a very nice uh, illustration showing how uh, policies uh, differ between uh, different countries and regions. So we see uh, that in, in some countries, uh, this is uh, uh, this uh, light blue color, uh, we see that in, in those countries, uh, any, anyone with symptoms is, is being tested. So this is mainly, ma mainly case finding. Uh, but then we have countries, uh, all the brown ones, uh, so they do testing for symptomatic cases, but also for other key groups. Key groups could be, for example, healthcare workers. Um, and then some other countries are, are much more liberal in the way to do the, the testing and also offer testing for asymptomatic uh, um, infections. And uh, of course, this, this mainly uh, uh, complicates things because uh, we have differing policies. It makes it very difficult to actually compare rates between countries and, and have a homogenous and consistent uh, global picture. Um, and also, uh, it means that the same diagnostics could actually perform differently in different countries just because of the testing indications. Because if one performed tests uh, in cases where the pretest probability uh, is much lower, for example, when a liber a more liberal testing policy is in place, that, that will, of course, uh, influence also test performance. So 
uh, a big issue for us. And uh, um, the flip side of that is, is the, the rate of uh, daily positive tests. And you can see this uh, really uh, varies. So some countries are experiencing uh, 25 or 50% positivity, whilst others have uh, less than 1%. Of course, we don't have at this point in time a good benchmark, uh, but I would say at least based on, on our experience in Israel and maybe some other countries that uh, um, it would be expected to have just a few, uh, a few percents of positive uh, tests a day uh, if you're not in, in amidst uh, uh, a very high incidence or, or a prominent wave on, of infection and you're doing sufficient testing. Uh, but this is, this is of course my, my impression and, and those benchmarks could uh, change uh, over time. A few words about uh, COVID-19 as a disease. Uh, it's an interesting disease uh, reminiscent of some other viruses that we already know well. Uh, but still, it's very important to uh, remind ourselves that uh, our entire population is uh, susceptible because it's a new virus. And then when people get exposed, we have a substantial percentage. It is now estimated uh, to be uh, over 50%, but the numbers uh, constantly change. Um, and that percentage is the people who develop uh, asymptomatic uh, infection. And uh, those people, of course, are, are much more difficult to identify unless uh, proactive testing is, uh, is being done, either around uh, known cases or, or just randomly. And we have uh, a smaller percentage who, be who become uh, symptomatic. And those asymptomatic uh, individuals, uh, a percentage of them, could end up in a hospital, so having uh, a more severe uh, case and uh, even a, a, um, a smaller percentage could end up in uh, intensive care or even succumb to, to the infection. And uh, these compartments are of course very important for all the uh, epidemiological modeling of uh, COVID-19, but it's also important in order to, to put the testing uh, into context because when one develops the capacity for doing the testing, and of course, capacity uh, is, is always finite. So we, we need to decide who to test and who not. So how to prioritize our testing. And uh, some of this prioritization also uh, needs to build on how we understand the disease and what sort of compartments of indiv infected individuals we're trying to, uh, to identify via testing. And uh, also to, re to remind ourselves that uh, our, our ultimate goal is to try and re reduce the, the R, so the effective uh, reproduction number that is uh, based upon the, the basic reproduction number, which is an attribute of the virus, but also uh, human behavior or the opportunities for uh, cross transmission. And uh, one of the ways to actually reduce the R uh, to less than one, which will render the, uh, uh, the pandemic, um, um, will uh, cause it to subside, is, uh, is via testing. So to understand where we are on the curve and also to uh, identify as many infective people as possible in order to terminate chains of transmission, because that will uh, inev inevitably uh, reduce uh, the R. So in many countries now, we're experiencing some sort of uh, extra uh, strategies. Um, we've, we've almost all countries have witnessed some sorts of, of, of lockdowns and now lockdowns are, are being uh, released. And that release could take place either uh, as, a, uh, as LIFO, so last in, first out, uh, or ha have uh, alternating lockdowns in some countries or trying to be more uh, differential in, um, in, in the exiting and to try and protect specific age groups or specific geographic localities, which seem to have become uh, hotspots for transmission. Uh, 
uh, and also to protect uh, the economy. And in order to enable that, and regardless of which uh, exit strategy is being uh, chosen by, by a country, we need to uh, generate decision support data. And, and, and these data, they build on three pillars as I see it. Uh, so we have the epidemiological data, we have the societal data, and we have laboratory data. And I will elaborate on, on uh, each of those uh, briefly. But uh, the lab data, of course, builds on, on our di diagnostic uh, strategies. And I already mentioned that uh, PCR is the main uh, diagnostic uh, strategy, but we also have serology and we will, we will hear about serology uh, later on today. So I will not get too much into that. Point of care testing, which is becoming a big thing in, in uh, laboratory medicine and of course in, in microbiology, is also a big thing for uh, COVID-19, um, especially as we're trying to uh, terminate chains of transmission. And that means that if we manage to uh, reduce the turnaround time and uh, have lab results as close as possible to the point of care or, or point of uh, epidemiological investigation, then we have a, a better uh, uh, possibility, at least in theory, uh, to, to control transmission. Uh, Next-gen sequencing is uh, also a big thing in, uh, in microbiology. And uh, NGS, as uh, some, of, some of you may know, has been uh, used very successfully in the past years as, as and it became already the, the gold standard for uh, phylogenetic analysis of uh, uh, pathogens, and that includes also viruses. So we are able to uh, sequence the entire genomes of, uh, of virus strains, in, in that case, uh, SARS coronaviruses. And looking at uh, subtle changes in the genome, we're uh, able to actually infer whether transmission chains have occurred uh, and also to track the spread of the virus um, during, uh, across uh, different uh, localities. And that is a very powerful tool and uh, it has been taking place in COVID-19 uh, quite early in the course of uh, the pandemic and I, I will show just one example. And there is also um, uh, really an, an enormous effort worldwide to, um, to try and develop novel diagnostics. So diagnostics that do not build on, on the more uh, accepted strategies like PCR or serology, but uh, using uh, other techniques. And just to name a few, uh, so we have uh, uh, quite a few uh, startup companies that are trying to uh, develop breath tests uh, that will identify uh, proteins or other signatures of the virus. And uh, if that works, it'd be very nice. Imagine that, uh, you know, a person arrives at the airport and he just uh, uses this uh, uh, disposable breathalyzer and he can say that person is, uh, uh, you know, COVID positive or negative and you can decide if they board uh, uh, their, their flight or not. Okay, so this is just one uh, uh, quite imaginary, but maybe not so far off uh, scenario. Uh, there is a, a big issue around testing uh, for COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the environment, like uh, switch testing. I, I will say a few words about this uh, in a moment. Um, and then uh, many other uh, really interesting developments uh, on the data science uh, side. So trying to infer um, um, the uh, infectious status based on, on different clinical parameters that there are being gathered uh, from patients or even analyzing uh, uh, the voice of individuals over the telephone to, to try and identify um, upper respiratory infection with uh, coronaviruses. So I think we're, we're witnessing uh, really a, a very nice uh, diagnostic uh, revolution um, during this pandemic. And uh, regardless of whether those new tests will 
um, uh, eventually, you know, make it to the market and, and turn out to be reliable uh, tests. I think that they are uh, driving uh, improvements, and uh, I think it's a it's a very uh, very nice um, uh, trend. Okay, so I, I mentioned uh, next-gen sequencing. So this is a, a phylogenetic uh, map of uh, many thousands of uh, cases that have been sequenced. And uh, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the root of the tree. So that is patient zero in theory uh, back in November in, uh, uh, in China. And you can see very nicely how uh, the virus evolved and spread uh, across time over uh, different uh, continents. And also you can see this intermixing of colors, which also means that we have um, the, the original Asian variants uh, um, very well spread out across Europe and North America. And just uh, this testifies to how complex is our chain of transmission. I mentioned uh, the issue of uh, wastewater testing. So many groups now are, are trying to uh, deploy PCR-based uh, tests on wastewater to uh, try and identify emergence of the virus in uh, uh, different catchment uh, areas. And that brings many uh, analytical issues because of course it's much more difficult to perform those tests on wastewater than on, on clinical samples. And we already heard about uh, different groups uh, finding traces of uh, virus nucleic acid from earlier tests than uh, December uh, 2019. And that calls into question the, actually the reliability of, of those uh, measurements. So before uh, finishing off, I'll try to summarize uh, some of the, the main challenges that we have uh, for diagnostics, which I think uh, many of those are very relevant, re very relevant to the uh, measurement community. So for requirements, we, we need uh, testing capacity that is clear. And of course, capacity involves not only the equipment and consumables, but also personnel and expertise. And the explosion in the number of tests uh, also resulted at least uh, in a temporary shortage in reagents and equipment. And, and that created significant bottlenecks. And uh, as the number of tests deployed are uh, is significantly increasing and constantly increasing, I think we will uh, witness more such bottlenecks. Of course, there are issues about uh, performance and accuracy because we have now um, more than a hundred um, um, different kits and assays that uh, uh, measure the virus. And of course, each have their different performance and it's very difficult to compare uh, with them. So the agreement between assays and harmonization of the assays uh, is, a, is clearly a challenge. Uh, one big issue, at least in my uh, view, is uh, the application of the tests. And uh, I think that it's, it's quite different if one is performing a test for clinical needs. So to identify uh, with a high degree of certainty, a clinical case, perhaps a case that one needs to decide whether to admit to the ICU or uh, administer uh, some experimental drug, uh, as opposing to doing surveillance. Because in order to uh, flatten the curve to reduce the R0 uh, or R effective below one, we don't really need to identify accurately 100% of cases. Uh, Counterintuitively, even if we succeed in doing that in 50% of cases uh, and, and just cut 50% of the transmission chains, uh, we will do just well in curbing the, the pandemic. And that means that uh, perhaps uh, a liberal use of not so accurate tests uh, could do the job. And of course, this is not the way we, we are used to uh, to, to look at uh, diagnostics. And I think this is something that merits uh, uh, discussion. But on the other hand, uh, having uh, short turnaround times means effective containment. 
There is a lot of issue about lab safety, um, and uh, I don't have time to go into that, but just say that uh, this is uh, really making uh, our testing uh, uh, much more difficult operationally. And another point is multiplexing. So as the winter is approaching and we may have uh, coronavirus and other uh, viruses like influenza or parainfluenza as, as we have in every winter, uh, we may have a need to actually uh, test for multiple pathogens and whether this could be done, you know, by, by just a single multiplexed assays remains to be uh, seen. And, and so the challenges uh, that result from that uh, is the varying performance and contamination uh, that I already uh, alluded to. Uh, the sampling technique, of course, the pre-analytics always uh, uh, influence that and there are no uniform methods also to, to do the sampling. Uh, many groups are now trying to do pooling in order to make uh, testing more, efi more efficient, but pooling could have uh, a cost of sensitivity and uh, uh, also its efficiency may uh, be uh, very much influenced on, on, um, by the background rate of infections. So also pooling, which is really a hot thing, uh, needs to be uh, still validated and, uh, and proven. And uh, last but not least is clinical validation. So we have many cases which are really uh, perplexing. We have those persistently uh, PCR positive cases, which we are not sure are actually infective. We have those uh, individuals that get tested in uh, two different hospitals with and getting different results and uh, it's not always easy to make the, the decisions on the public health side. Do we need to isolate them or not? Uh, what do we do with the people who have been exposed to those individuals? So many open questions uh, that the science of measurement I think uh, should answer uh, soon. So uh, just to, uh, to conclude, in, uh, in the short term, we're using the diagnostics for uh, cluster investigation and containment to model the transmission and to monitor our lockdowns and uh, maybe also to, to plan and use better our uh, uh, health resources. But in the longer term, as we have more diagnostics and uh, more uh, uh, maybe uh, complex diagnostics, and uh, more, um, so more point of care or, or more novel methods, then we could be thinking of uh, doing some more interesting applications like uh, monitoring uh, vaccination, uh, like um, some countries are already referring to uh, COVID passports. So can we, uh, uh, can we say to people, you're COVID free, you can travel wherever you like. Uh, so these are all open questions and this remains to be validated. And of course, we still need to prepare for the, the real second wave, the, the next uh, winter and the next pandemic. Uh, just to mention before I close uh, that uh, this year, uh, our uh, Congress ECMID has been uh, canceled because of uh, coronavirus. But in uh, end of September, we will have uh, ECVID, which is the ECMID conference on coronavirus disease. It's going to be uh, an online virtual conference and you're all uh, most invited to register. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very, thank much, you very Jacob. much, Jacob. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. So, Jim? Sorry, Rob. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Jacob. Um, I realize that we should be clapping, but obviously that's not going to work in this forum. But I really, really appreciate that. It was a fantastic presentation. Um, on behalf of everybody listening. Um, a question that you really articulated well how the different ways countries approach um, essentially their testing on who they test can really um, complicate how you assess the prevalent or the disease in a given country, you know, and, and, and how liberal they are. Um, whether, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna only test people who have got temperature with respiratory symptoms versus if you just test everybody. To what extent do you think, and this is preempting a bit of the, the Heinz's uh, presentation has come along, um, discrepancies within the test, analytical performance discrepancies within the, let's say, PCR testing for the moment, obviously this applies to everything, also complicates that, that outlook? Um, so, I mean, based on our field experience, uh, there is some analytical 
variation between uh, different commercial tests. Um, of course, there are many different recipes also for in-house tests, but uh, I think the in-house tests, uh, at least some of them have been uh, sort of endorsed by WHO and other uh, uh, governing, governing bodies and uh, have been perhaps more uh, controlled and are also more likely to be performed by uh, expert users in uh, national public health institutes and so forth. So I'm, I'm a bit less worried about those tests and, and in many countries, uh, those are the reference tests uh, for the, the more commercial tests which are uh, widely used. And we definitely see, and I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't you know, name uh, specific uh, providers, uh, but just to say that amongst the, uh, the very uh, widespread uh, kits that are being used, uh, we see sometimes uh, differences up to 20% with respect to uh, sensitivity. Of course, it's very difficult to assess uh, in, in this chaotic uh, environment, but uh, this is uh, our notion. And also differences in sensitivity uh, that manifest as, uh, you know, CQ uh, values. So the same, the same uh, mm -hmm. sample being tested uh, by uh, different kits on different machines. Uh, and, and we definitely see sometimes uh, um, a difference that make the results much, much closer to the indeterminate uh, cutoff. So I think, I think it's an issue, uh, but as I said, at, at the population level, I don't think that it's a big issue. Uh, it's a big issue when you, when you concentrate on, on, a, on an individual and you need to, to make informed decision about a specific case. Yeah. But more mm -hmm. widely speaking, I don't think it's, a, it's that big of an issue. No problem, that makes sense. Uh, I have one other quick question, but I wonder perhaps, Heinz, if you want to set up while I ask Jacob this question and then you'll be ready to go, uh, Heinz Leichhardt, if that's okay. Um, Jacob, the, the wastewater measurement, is that mm -hmm. potentially causing risk of mm -hmm. transmission or is it not? We shouldn't worry about that as a source of transmission. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Um, I, th there is an ongoing controversy uh, in this regard, and uh, uh, we've we've just submitted uh, also an opinion paper uh, on that. So, based on some risk assessments, uh, there might be uh, some potential for aerosolization around wastewater treatment facilities, which could result in uh, increased exposure. Uh, for example, of sewage workers. And of course, in less regulated countries, uh, there might be uh, exposure of, also of the wider population. Uh, but, you know, I don't think that that will be like the main significant public health issue. Uh, still, human to human droplet transmission is, uh, is the, big, the biggest thing. And I, I would like to see how we can harness switch testing in order to uh, make a good early warning system on when the, vir the virus is, uh, is exacerbating. No problem. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jacob. Um, without further ado, I would like now to hand over to Heinz Zeichardt, who's going to be presenting the work from one of the first international PT tests on SARS-CoV-2. Thank you very much, Heinz. So, Heinz, we need to ask you to start your camera and to unmute yourself. So, can you hear me now? Yes, and we just need to see your camera as well. Thank you. Okay. Everything fine now? No, not yet. I can't see you yet, no. <laughs> Uh, you know, it tells me I can't, I can't open the video because the host has stopped it. You, oh, so, we can see you now. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So, I don't know if you could hear me before. First of all, thank you very much uh, to Robert and to Jim for the invitation. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we are able to present our data on, I think, one of the first EQA schemes, PT schemes, on the molecular diagnostics of uh, SARS-CoV-2. 
And this is a cooperation of those people, Martin Kammel and, and Hans-Peter Grunert in Berlin and the whole group. And we are so happy that we could already cooperate in this field, but also in other fields of virus diagnostics with Denise O'Sullivan and Jim Huggett. Um, just my short disclosure, I'm shareholder and CEO of GVD and IQ, uh, QVD in Berlin, just for clarification. And we work under the scientific umbrella of the German Association for Prevention of Virus Diseases and um, of the Society of Virology and the German Society of Hygiene and Microbiology. We have really a lot of partners because it's really a big deal to run this. In Berlin, these are our two groups. In Düsseldorf, this is one of the two officially appointed uh, PT providers of the German uh, Medical Association. One is Instant, which I'm representing, and my colleague Neumeyer, he's representing RFB, the other officially appointed um, organization for EQA schemes. We are cooperating with 38 uh, expert laboratories, including uh, our official laboratories from Robert Koch and Paul Ehrlich Institute, the National Reference and Conciliary Laboratories. And to go into standardization, we really needed the cooperation in the EMRP and ORAMED uh, funded projects. At first, we cooperated with LGC and uh, uh, JRC and, and, and NIB in uh, Slovenia and PTB in, 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 in Berlin in Germany. And we are very happy that now NIST from USA has also joined our group. It's a wonderful cooperation. Um, just to show you what we are doing, and I think nearly everybody of you in the, in the loop knows, we are dealing with diagnosis of patients and of blood donors. We have a pre-analytical and a post-analytical phase. Uh, we all have to take care about internal quality control. And this um, orange part here, um, this represents the EQA schemes. Everything is clearly regulated by the ISO 15189 and by the German Medical Association guidelines. And I'm talking mainly about the, um, the EQA schemes, but you see this green interconnection between the upper and the lower square. And what we are doing is to build in an interconnection between EQA schemes, which are a, a, a snapshot run twice, three, four, five times a year, and the daily work, daily internal quality control. But this is something we are talking during my uh, presentation a little bit later. Uh, I'm representing Instant. Instant has more than 350 programs. Um, Martin Kammel and I, we are um, the leaders of the instant EQA schemes in virology. We are responsible for nearly 80 EQA schemes. And then in, in 2020, we have more than 2,000 participants um, in the EQ, participating in the EQA schemes from approximately 60 countries. This is our portfolio, which what, what, what we are taking care. And here the yellow highlighted um, 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 section is we introduced in April the SARS-CoV-2 uh, EQA scheme into our already existing EQA scheme for coronaviruses, including MERS-CoV-2. And at the lower part here, we also started with the SARS-CoV-2 serology schemes, and uh, it has just been evaluated and is available on the screen on the homepage of Instant. But I'm not going to talk about this. So now we come to the EQA scheme uh, for molecular diagnostics of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we have a very good and strong cooperation with our national consultant laboratory for coronaviruses. This is a lab at Charité um, of Christian Drosten and Victor Korman and Daniela Niemeyer. And then we have a very close cooperation when we had the setup of these schemes with our groups from Frankfurt and Cologne and in Berlin. And here are the three uh, national measurement institutes, LGT, and also University of Surrey, represented by Jim, and then the PTB and NIST. So that's what we did. Uh, we sent out, in April, we sent out seven samples, and we were asking for sensitivity. Therefore, we introduced sensitivity panels, four of them, in a dilution of one to a thousand down to one to million. The virus uh, came from uh, 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 Corman and, 
and uh, Drosten, and it is the uh, beta cov Unix train. And it was heat inactivated, so it was easy to send it around as a lyophilized sample. So we had four different concentrations of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and then we had a specificity panel of um, uh, three different uh, um, uh, samples, and one contained uh, the OC43, the other the, 20, the 229E, and then we had cell lysates of MSC5. Um, now at the red, uh, red right-hand side, you see where the samples evaluated after the closure of the, the dead line of the E2A scheme. And in three cases, and for three uh, samples, we say no. Why? We received a lot of phone calls during the uh, PT run and a lot of e uh, emails. And these emails and phone calls were sometimes quite desperate. And the participants were asking, we do not know if we are performing correctly our SARS-CoV-2 molecular diagnostics. We need anchor. We need some help and advice. Therefore, we disclosed two different samples, two differently concentrated samples containing SARS-CoV-2 and one sample containing the OC43 human coronavirus so that the laboratories could see already during the run of the PT uh, uh, um, scheme if they were performing correctly. Um, short outline. Uh, at first, I concentrate on the specificity panel, then on the sensitivity panel, and finally, I will go to uh, what we are doing uh, with the just running scheme, June, July, and I will focus on DPCR results of our National Institute cooperators I mentioned before. So we concentrate on the specificity panel. I already mentioned um, that they contained two human coronaviruses and the lysate of MFC. Uh, five cells, not uh, infected cells. And this is the outcome of the uh, specificity result. We had um, 463 laboratories uh, which reported results. Some of them dropped out. We had registrations of 478 uh, and from, from uh, 36 countries. And here, when we look uh, at this table, uh, it's very easy to understand sample number, sample property, then the expected result, qualitative result, then we broke down the data according to the gene region. And here are the, a number, the number of analyses per total number of reported results um, uh, if they were correct in regard to the expected um, uh, qualitative result. And uh, I just concentrate on the errors here. And the specificity results were quite good. Uh, you see for the OC43, 97.8% of the results were correct negative. Uh, now uh, I go directly to the um, MSC5 results. Down here, uh, we had 696 analyses of the 983 total number of analyses and 98.6% were correctly negative. What happened to the sample in the middle uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the last two digits, six, five? This was a 229E sample. And um, um, when we look at the black uh, numbers here, uh, when we had our first analysis, only 92% of the sample, 92.4% were correctly negative. Then we traced this down and we found out that uh, 24 laboratories, which means 58 analyses in total of, um, of, of, of a group, a regional uh, uh, group, which were under the strong supervision of a very uh, active lab supervisor. They had to report their results at first to a data bank of this lab coordinator. And when they reported the, res the results to the instant homepage, they really with precision they mixed up the results and uh, they mixed up the sample of this negative sample containing the 229E virus uh, with a positive sample and we will see this later. So when we uh, back calculated the data, actually we had 90, uh, no, sorry, 79.3% correct negative results, which means when we trace it back that 
between 2.7 and uh, 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 1.4 of the results were not correct negative. Uh, we could discuss this later, but we traced this down and we found out that these were test no sorry that this were, were these were laboratory imminent problems that they had really uh, they, they needed some help and advice and we could be quite helpful in this sense. So now we go to the sensitivity panel, the qualitative results, and at first we concentrate on the CQ values and the laboratories also reported CP, C, CT, and CN values, but all this is equivalent to CQ values. Uh, we concentrate on the four samples highlighted in, in red. This is the dilution series of one to a thousand to one to one million. And um, again, we concentrate now on the errors and we see that uh, taking into account the qualitative results, which means we expect positive, 99.7% correct results. Then the tenfold higher diluted sample, 98.8%. Uh, then we go to the corrected value because this was the mix up sample, 98.5% uh, uh, correct positive results. And when we came down to the one to one million, uh, diluted sample, 93.0% um, of the results were correct positive. So, you know, the sample of one to a million diluted was already at the edge. Now we go to the very right column of this slide, and here are the um, CP or CQ values reported uh, by the laboratories. And these are um, average values. And when we concentrate, we, 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 we make an average of the average values of the uh, results for the different gene targets. And you see 22.8 uh, for the highest concentrated sample. Then 26.0 uh, CT or CQ value uh, for the one to 10,000 diluted sample, 29.5 for the one to 100,000, and then 32.4 um, uh, C, uh, uh, CQ for the one to a million uh, diluted sample. So this is more or less the expected 3.3 difference between the tenfold dilutions. But when you look to the, to the extremes that were reported, then you see enormously high variation. Here, 16.8 to 34 um, CQ values were reported for the E gene, et cetera. So, we really had to look into details, and this is shown in the next slide. We now concentrate only on the sample diluted to one to one million. And you see here, I just highlighted the results for in-house tests. Um, the median for all of the CQ values reported was uh, uh, 32.9, but the variation was between 25.7 to 37.5. When we go to another commercial test, which is highlighted here, the variation is much smaller. Um, but are we content with such a variation? No, we are not content. And now we have broken down the results to the different um, uh, uh, to, to the different genes and different manufacturers. And um, here you can see in this slide that we have 300 and 36 analyses in total, and the median for all of these results of the one to one million diluted sample was 32.1. When we concentrate on the device A, which actually is a um, point of care device, a cartouche test, you see that we have quite a small variation here. Um, we have 30, uh, uh, one point uh, oh, 0 for the CQ. When we go to the B device, um, this is a commercial device. The C is also a commercial device. And then these in-house devices, devices, you see that we have a much higher variation. And this is not only seen for E gene. When we looked also for N gene and RDRP, then you can see that the variation is more or less in the same range for both gene targets N and RDRP. But I would like to focus for one second on the D device. And everything is published, so this is the Abbott test. And you would think that um, a median 
for the CQ of 20.5 is much better than the one here for, uh, uh, for B device 33 or for the in-house 34.2. Uh, the problem is that Abbott has a pre-amplification introduced in their um, uh, PCR uh, test and therefore they always produce lower CT values. But when we trace this phenomenon back to dilution theories, we see that the D device, the Abbott device, also really has the same threshold according to sensitivity as the other devices, the B and C devices, and also the A device. So this was quite interesting. Now we looked for our results, the quantitative results, QPCR and DPCR. And here, we, we, again, we look at the one to one million diluted sample. On the right hand side of the panel, you see the QPCR results for the E gene, the N gene, open reading frame, RDRP, and S gene. And again, what you can see, quite a high variation. When you go to the left hand side, these are re the results from the digital PCR. And it is not um, a secret. These are the, the results of the three national measurement institutes I mentioned before. And here we have very low variation. And we were very, very happy to see this for the E gene, for the N gene. Uh, we are all in the, for this uh, sample, um, wait, sorry. Um, uh, uh, in, in, in a very good um, range and comparative result. When we go to the RDRP, then we see one of the national measurement institutes also measured by DPCR for RDRP gene, uh, but we know that the reverse primer of this uh, gene has uh, two uh, uh, mismatches, and therefore um, this reflects, probably this reflects the lower sensitivity for this gene. We can talk about this a little bit later. Now, um, to make it short, but to give you an overall about all of the results for all of the genes and a breakdown according to the results we obtained for qPCR and dPCR. Left panel. These are all genes here um, in one slide. <laughs> Uh, the results for all, all genes. And um, here you can see each of the line, the green one here, for instance, represents one laboratory. They are approximately um, um, always a little bit higher than the expected and also the allowed um, uh, concentration range uh, we assigned to this value. The reddish, the thick reddish line is the consensus value of all of the quantitative results um, we obtained from all the laboratories to uh, all of the genes. But you see some of them, these laboratories down here in the lower uh, section of this uh, slide, they have a, 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 probably a calibration of their test, which is uh, uh, not uh, really comparable to the laboratories here within the allowed ranges, and the allowed ranges is plus minus one log 10 about the uh, red line here uh, we have uh, highlighted in the middle of the uh, of, for, for all genes. And now we go to the breakdown for the qPCR data. These are uh, the, um, uh, the blue lines and the dPCR data. And you can see the variation between the different qPCR results, what we've seen already before, is also reflected here for all of the genes uh, and the results um, reported by the different laboratories. For the dPCR, they are more or less, the lines are in close vicinity and only one of the laboratories um, uh, reported a lower, a lower concentration, and this is RDRP. And this can be seen in this very complex slide, but we can go through this very easily here for the E gene. All of the results, we concentrate on the green ones, on the green lines, were in close vicinity to each other. No results reported for the S gene. The N gene results, very narrow, very closely um, uh, um, uh, oriented uh, to each other, and these are the RDRP results. So we, are, we have here in, in, in front of us a problem of calibration, 
um, when we look at the quantitative results from qPCR, and how can we tackle this? And now we have already been in very good cooperation in the field of quantitation of CNV and HIV-1. And I, I don't go into the deep details, but I just want to show you that in this cooperation for CMV with a group of LGC, with Jim and his colleagues, with the NIB colleagues and the JRC uh, colleagues, um, we tackled this problem. And uh, the background and the basis for our uh, cooperation was um, results from September 2015 for CMV, quantitative uh, results for CMV, cytomegalovirus. On the left-hand side, the results reported in copies per milliliter. And you can see that some of the laboratories, each of the line represents one laboratory. They are really out of the accepted range. Some of them are within the accepted range. These are the reddish dotted lines. Some of them have sensitivity problems. And when we go to an IU per milliliter reporting system, then we see more or less a thunderstorm. Heinz, no calibration at uh, all. Heinz, sorry to interrupt, about, about two minutes. Yep, I'm through, I'm through. And Thank you now for the CMV, for the CMV here, we could see that um, DPCR uh, results, and this is here on the, 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 the green line, and this is the average of the DPCR results, which were reported just half a year, half a year later in March 2016, perfect uh, 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 agreement with the consensus values in copies per mil and international units. I skipped the next slide because for HIV, we had the same results, very good um, um, uh, 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 alignment with the results from our uh, consensus values. And now the last two slides are on the DPCR for the just running EQA scheme, June, July, 2020. Um, we decided together with LGC, PTB and NIST to unveil again uh, one of the samples and this sample was pre-measured by DPCR. And we are really delighted, all of us working in this cooperation, that the results from lab one, two, and three targeting the also different genes, um, that um, we have a very, for this uh, sample, a very good consensus var value with very low variation. And we assigned a consensus value of 1,570 copies per mil. Um, and these are the data we received from the DPCR. And we all know that the digital PCR is a method uh, which does not need a calibrator. And therefore, um, we, we think that this will be in future or could be um, um, a, a measurement, um, reference measurement a procedure to assign values to samples used in the diagnostics of infectious disease pathogens. I'm at the end. Molecular PT uh, schemes, we have challenges in sensitivity and specificity. I will not go into the serological PT values because my colleague from Mannheim will talk about this. I thank you for your, um, uh, for your attendance. And in case you have further questions, please contact Martin Kammer, who is also in the loop, or contact me and yeah, thank them. Thanks a lot, and I'm prepared for questions. Thank you very much, Heinz. Um, great game. We are all clapping across the world. It's very, very grateful. A great, great study. Thank you. Very quick question, um, and I'll hand over to Jeremy. Do you think that automatic platforms, um, like the CAFAID, like uh, some of the other the Panther systems maybe, um, are, more, uh, are less susceptible to discrepancies you're observing? Or do you think actually it's it doesn't really matter compared to an automatic, you know, an in-house or a method that requires more laboratory, central laboratory steps. No, I'm, I'm convinced that also the Panther system uh, uh, will, will, uh, can cope with this, with this question. Uh, and um, uh, we already have some experience in our pre-study for the forthcoming scheme that these uh, systems work very well. Multiplexing works very well, and we have already introduced SARS-CoV-2 in the forthcoming multiplex EQA schemes, and we will see uh, how um, the participants can pick up this virus and differentiate it from influenza or para-influenza or RSV. I don't see, actually, I don't, 
face severe problems coming up in the future. Okay, well, thank you very much. And um, with that, I will uh, hand over to Jeremy. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Adumeyer. Uh, so whenever you're ready, Michael. Okay, let me try to share my screen. Um, should be here. It's not. Um, uh, wait. Uh, I have to. Uh. No. You can see okay. it, yeah, wonderful. You can see it, okay, yeah. sorry for that. Um, thanks, uh, Jeremy, for uh, the introduction early on and also the opportunity to um, present some of the thoughts that are um, associated with uh, getting immunotesting um, for um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And the things we are interested in most is the challenges and the standardization of the measurement and what we can learn from the interlaboratory studies, although I have to say there are so few of them at the moment, and that certainly has to do with the fact that um, um, standardization is far away from what we have just seen from uh, Professor Zeichert uh, regarding the nucleic acids um, diagnostics. So what I would like to address is basically um, the question of um, what the um, SARS-CoV-2 proteome and the antigenic drift will do for um, uh, aspects of standardization. And we'll uh, shortly go into differences in the antigens that are part of the immune response, the antibody repertoire, the plasticity, and discuss maybe later about cross immunity from other viral encounters, um, which are some interesting hypotheses that I think should be looked at um, also regarding long-lasting immunity. And obviously you can do a standardization um, uh, with the antigens. You can uh, express recombinant antigens. You can do this in E. coli, in insect cells, mammalian cells, particularly for the conformational epitopes. And then there, of course, are synthetic antigens like peptides and peptide arrays that are particularly interesting for linear epitopes. And there's a many um, B-cell epitopes actually that are linear as far as uh, this is predicted from computer modeling. And then we will look uh, into some um, results from first um, validation results. And what I'm, I'm very interested in is also, and what really want to discuss is the question of what the implications are of antibody testing at the moment and the current limits with regard to public health um, questions. And so I would end with uh, discussing predictive values um, and how to educate um, uh, re in, in this regard. So if you start with the antigens, um, of, obviously there's proteins of SARS-CoV-2 and here you have a list of the proteins. Up here you have the schematic of the genome and obviously many of those tests that are being uh, available and um, test for antibodies in the serum of patients against uh, the spike protein and the um, receptor binding domain um, against ACE2 and also the nuclear capsid uh, protein, also commercialized assays. Um, we have seen uh, the, uh, this, this slide before from Jacob uh, from the GIS8 webpage, which is very interesting here you can see there are approximately 3,500 complete genome sequences from isolates in various countries. And um, you can have here the phylogenetic tree. And if you click on, on those, you can find um, uh, various variants and um, where they have been found in sequence. And for example, in Germany, down here, you would have one of our super spreaders, people coming back from skiing vacation in Ischgl in the 
Alps and they contracted the virus there and they got back to their um, uh, uh, little city in Germany called Heinsberg where they uh, generated the super spreader. Um, so you find uh, all kinds of um, and useful information here. Um, so the question is uh, then first for standardization of uh, immunotesting, what are the standard antigens that you measure against? If you look at uh, the antigenic variation that can be found in each and every of these genomic sequences, I just picked one out here for you. It's a nuclear uh, capsid protein and there's one um, uh, variation here which is an aspartate in the position 377 that changes to a glycine and this uh, virus variant and obviously this may have then of course um, implications for antigenicity and also immune response that you can measure against that. Um, and this is shown here from a, a web page and a resource which is a in B cell epitope predicting uh, linear epitopes. Um, and here you can see the uh, nucleotide, a uh, nucleocapsid protein. And this is the aspartate in question. And here you can see in yellow, the epitope prediction areas where epitopes are being um, expected, where you find antibodies against those epitopes. And I set the threshold here to 0.6, which makes it more stringent. But you can see that in the area of 377, which is where this aspartate is being located, that's quite a prominent epitope prediction area. And you can basically then take a, a zoom in here, and here you have this uh, uh, aspartate here for in the middle of this epitope prediction area. And if you change that into a glycine, you see that the overall um, uh, score is much lower and also broader. So obviously, um, uh, you can expect from changes in the amino acid sequence, obviously in some areas you can um, expect differences in epitope um, and also of course probably differences in antibody response against this particular um, determinant. So the uh, question remains, what is the standard antigens um, that we can measure against and what we measure patient uh, responses against? So this means if you test for a SARS-CoV-2 immune responses, you can see here two old uh, electron microscopy slides from an IgM molecule. You can see the pentameric and um, uh, uh, structure here. And here you have um, electron microscopy um, and pictures of uh, immunoglobulin G. Um, if you think about how this immunoreceptor repertoire is being generated uh, through um, genetic recombination of building blocks that are depicted here, very old slide, everybody knows those. You have variable segments, diversity, and so on and so on. And all together, you end up with diversities here that are um, uh, at a staggering um, variability of antibodies that you could encounter, at least calculate. And this is not taking into account um, let's say non-template editing or somatic carbon mutations that is usually occurring in antibodies as they mature during a maturing um, uh, immune response. In this picture here, I show you a paratope assembly of the, the six different CDRs that make up the paratope, the antigen combining site as a water accessible surface. And down here you can see the same basically then also um, specified regarding amino acid side chain characteristics like ACET amino acid side chains or basic or let's say hydrophilic or even also arom aromatic um, side chains basically making up uh, the antibody specificity and while this is being assembled uh, as I just said you have uh, during the maturation of the immune response you have uh, additional somatic hyper mutations that occur, change the amino acid of the um, antibody and change its affinity and avidity for the respective uh, specific antigen. So in addition, making um, it, things more complicated in this way. Now, turning back to the um, uh, virus proteins here, and there is uh, the point of homologies between uh, coronavirus proteins and the inventory of B and T cell epitopes that are being 
um, assumed or have been shown in the former coronavirus uh, studies. Um, and you can see here uh, that there are high homologies in some parts um, in between some of the coronaviruses and lower homologies uh, with other viruses. Altogether, so far, um, uh, there's a, a fair assumption saying for different glycopro for different proteins, there are different number of B cell epitopes, particularly for the spike glycoprotein and for the nuclear protein, nuclear capsid protein. Many of them being linear indeed. Um, so the, the question remains then if we have linear epitopes against um, SARS-CoV-2 and we can have a polyclonal immune response against um, those epitopes by the patient, how can we envisage that we can standardize this type of reaction in a way? And there's a good um, example in the literature from uh, 2012, which is dealing with polyclonal antibody binding to variants for a single epitope, in this particular case, HIV, the GP41 linear epitope, that's uh, the, the core sequence of which is shown here. And in, in this uh, very interesting uh, paper, they took the core epitope uh, residues, the leucine here, uh, yeah, the leucine, uh, yeah, yeah, lucin here, the aspartate, the lysine, and also the tryptophan, and replaced it with the uh, amino acids that you can see here. And they show that um, in the different um, uh, to the different days during which the immune response is mounted, like in blue, um, uh, 14 days, in green, 38 days, and in orange, 83 days, you can see how this the reactivity is being influenced by substitutions or for example, antigenic drift um, uh, against this particular epitope and um, only for this particular position. And the interesting thing is that you obviously cannot compute this really. What you can see is that there's the polyclonal response is a little bit, um, uh, a little bit um, uh, resistant and resilient against uh, these types of uh, um, uh, substitutions. But you can see the monoclonal antibody, which is here, this um, uh, open triangles, they are basically extremely affected by uh, certain substitutions. In some case, no um, antibody response is being uh, uh, encountered. This shows you um, the development of antibody uh, responses uh, in COVID-19 patients, particularly from the new Cochrane database survey but on, you have to say that in this particular case, the prevalence is very, very high with up to 50%. And obviously the specificities are therefore uh, uh, shown to be very consistent, which is something that we do not encounter in asymptomatic um, uh, populations that are being tested for uh, using these antibodies, uh, the, the, these, yeah, using these tests. Um, let me just briefly show that we sometimes find patients that do show immunoglobulin G but before they show immunoglobulin M. And this is obviously not um, accounted for by immunogenetics principles of antibody formation, where you always first have an IgM expression upon recombination and later on then get an, an OSA switch to a different class in this particular case, IgG1, for example. So that means if you have um, a patient with early IgG but no detectable IgM, how do you explain this? So possibly what we could have is a memory B cells that are uh, uh, residual from a, a earlier viral encounter that are being uh, revived but may not be sufficient uh, before a new IgM uh, response is being mounted. So this is a question that we do not exactly and know where these early antibodies come from and what their type of cross-reactivity are. So let me get to the final part very quickly. So we talked about antigenic drift in viral proteins and the polyclonal repertoire, the plasticity and the dynamics. And the analytical assessment has to take into account these types of things. There's a very good uh, a thorough study on the performance of immunotesting that has been conducted in April by Whitman that's shown here and using test systems, both um, uh, lateral flow assays and ELISA formats. And you can see here on the right on the left hand side, the time course of these patients here um, and how the uh, IgM and IgG response develops. 
And the interesting part here is the, this um, uh, number B here, the B panel, where you can show that indeed um, in er uh, samples from the pre-COVID era, um, you can find substantial uh, cross-reactivities, obviously, um, for a number of these tests. And in these samples down here from the post-COVID era, uh, which have been tested negative both for COVID-19 um, and also by BioFire for other viruses, you can see in part substantial cross-reactivities, making it difficult um, to assess particularly the uh, predictive value and the, the, the value of such immune testing in these um, types of settings. Lateral flow tests are something that is um, uh, probably being a very uh, important in the future. And this is a personal communication from a paper Noclus from Sverre Sandberg who have identified and evaluated 17 different LFAs in part with good results, in part with very, very high specificities. Although you have to say that there is some variation, of course, in, in, in case of the 95% confidence interval. Um, another thing in, uh, that needs to be taken care of in external quality assessment evaluation of tests is the commutability uh, when testing in serum and plasma, for example, in the um, LFA tests. And here you can see three different test uh, formats uh, that show different uh, deviations, good uh, comparability of serum and plasma uh, results, and some that are less uh, uh, well uh, established and less, level, less correlating. The, the final aspect here that I want to bring up very quickly is um, a first emerging external quality assessments for immunotesting that have been done by the RFB in, um, uh, in um, April as a prelude to a more extensive um, a test that is being done now with 172 laboratories. We have preliminary results here as well, but the, the thing is that the um, concordance between the results in immunotesting is much uh, lower than what we have seen on the nucleic acid testing um, aspect. I would like to skip that particular um, 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 slide and come to the last um, two slides here, which says basically, these are the, 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 the data that I've shown you from Whitman before. And here we calculated the average sensitivity and specificity from this uh, study and looked at, if we assume different prevalences, of uh, antibodies in the populations, different prevalences, we end up with very, very different positive predictive value, which is a big problem, obviously, um, for uh, interpreting those results, also for people that get themselves tested. There was only one of those tests that had a 100% specificity uh, throughout the whole study. And this one, of course, will then be independent of the prevalence and give you a result that you can interpret in any um, particular way. Um, we think that it's very important to educate the uh, population regarding the value of those immuno tests. And the reason for this is because um, if you do um, testing with immuno testing in the asymptomatic population, you are prone to come up with much higher numbers of so-called infected or supposed, supposedly infected or post-infected or immune people. And this obviously will overestimate the, um, the, the herd immunity or the spread within the population. And at the same time, will underestimate um, the um, uh, mortality rate. So this obviously will then or could lead to uh, very serious discussions about whether or not you should be upholding um, social distancing and safety measures. If you can then, if you could argue on the basis of too high um, uh, false positives, that people would not need any safety measures because the mortality rate is only um, as high as the flu or even though lower. And therefore we did this immunitor calculator as we call it, where we can basically have 400 um, cities and counties in Germany 
and where you can enter certain specificities and you can show for any of those um, cities, you can find what the positive predictive value will be um, in, with respect to certain prevalence. And this will give you an idea whether or not there's a big risk for you if you consider yourself immune or not. So I would like to conclude that immunotesting involves multiple dimensions of molecular interactions that are dynamic during infection and also in immunity. There is no or little, I would say, no chance of standardization of immunotesting in COVID-19 because our analyte is not one single molecule that's being, it's not selected against. External quality assessments can only help to harmonize the systematic influences to, as, to assess assay quality, but I think it's not much more than that. Um, until specificities reach 100%, low prevalences in asymptomatic populations will severely reduce the positive predictive value of antibody test results, and such low PPVs will have important public health and political implications for over-diagnosis and underestimation of mortality. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Neumeyer. Uh, so maybe I'll ask one quick question uh, while we set up the next presentation. Uh, so I was fascinated by the epitope of prediction tools. I'm just wondering if they're using amino acid um, uh, of properties in combination with theoretical folding. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, so there's um, uh, usually there's predicting uh, epitopes, of course, on the basis of computer modelings, which have been uh, quite uh, successful uh, during the recent years, uh, and thereby modelling by homology. And then usually what's happening then is that you have peptide arrays on which you test um, and that's basically the way how you do it. And so I don't, I'm, not, I'm not having a certain um, percentage of uh, success on how many of those, what the percentages of epitopes that can be correctly predicted. But uh, we have ourselves used some of those um, uh, peptides predictions and they seem to be interesting, particularly in an area where the receptor binding domain would um, uh, implicate, let's say, neutralization of uh, the binding between the virus and the, um, uh, the ACE2 molecule at this particular point. Of course, things that are at the moment only possible in virus neutralization tests. Great, uh, thanks again for your presentation. Uh, with that, I will hand over and ask uh, Dr. Michael Jabot to please uh, unmute. And the uh, floor is yours. Okay, uh, thanks, Jeremy. I uh, hope everybody can, can hear me. Um, so again, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of the webinar for inviting me to speak on some of the work we've done on uh, serological platform assessment in Canada at the National Microbiology Lab. So today I'll talk about some of the development and assessment of these platforms for surveillance and potential immunity correlation. Let's see if it advances. Oh, there we go. So uh, my presentation is going to be divided into a number of sections. I'll give a very brief Canadian perspective on uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'll then uh, go into a brief introduction to a number of the serology platforms that are available today. And, uh, and of course, what's key, as Michael was mentioning, I the standardization is very challenging with regard to various uh, platforms, uh, but uh, reference panels do play a key role. And uh, with respect to sensitivity and specificity considerations and caveats, I'll uh, go into that as well uh, further into the talk and actually give you some examples of some of the data that we've generated uh, using various KIP assessment uh, projects and then talk a little more detail into neutralization assays. And again, uh, some of the, uh, the caveats around using these as in vitro uh, correlates of immunity, and then and the talk with some of the conclusions uh, from our work. 
So with regard to Canada, obviously we've been infected uh, as many, many countries uh, throughout the globe with the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and we have cases from uh, coast to coast with over 105,000 confirmed cases and approaching 9,000 deaths at this time. Now, obviously uh, there are certain regions in Canada that have been hit harder than others. Our more populated provinces such as Quebec and Ontario certainly uh, bear a major brunt of uh, exposures. And I should mention that uh, with regard to our reference panels, we've uh, worked with a number of collaborators uh, uh, providing, uh, 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 that have provided us with our serum samples for our reference panels that I'll be speaking to uh, during the talk. So what is the utility of serological platforms? Obviously, they're not so much uh, used for diagnostics, uh, but they are uh, key tools for carrying out seroprevalence or seroprevalence so that we can better track SARS-2 virus spread in communities, uh, hopefully facilitate a better understanding of immune status, and uh, guide or inform public health decisions before or after a vaccine or therapeutics may be uh, available. And there are three basic platforms that uh, were alluded to earlier by uh, Dr. Neumeyer. Um, these are rapid cassette tests or lateral flow uh, platforms, uh, amino assays or ELISAs, and then the neutralization assays. And uh, of course, uh, various antigens or antigen combinations can be used in these various uh, uh, test kits or assays, including the spike protein, the component of the spike protein referred to as the receptor binding domain or nucleocapsid uh, uh, protein. And uh, the majorities detect IgG. However, as uh, these particular assays have continued to be developed, a uh, number can also detect IgM, IgA, or combinations. So again, without going into a lot of detail, um, this uh, diagram shows the lateral flow assay architecture. Um, and really what I will just want to emphasize, the advantages of this somewhat point of care format includes the generation of qualitative results in approximately 15 minutes or less, uh, which in which a drop of blood or plasma or serum can be added to these particular cassettes and you will see the, uh, the presence or, no, or non-presence of bands indicating IgG or IgM isotope uh, presence from the sample. Now we did encounter some sensitivity issues with the first available RCT kits, but we've also noted that there's been improvement uh, as these kits continue to evolve. The second category are the enzyme immunoassays or ELISA-based serological platforms in which direct or indirect formats provide colometric fluorescent signals depending on the uh, level of antibody in the present, in the, in the particular uh, patient sample. And again, there's uh, either manual plate-based kits, or now we have very high throughput instruments that can process uh, hundreds of samples within hours. And, uh, and of course, maybe the, uh, the engines that will drive a lot of the high-level zero surveillance projects that are going on globally, and particularly that we are planning here in Canada. Um, so the, uh, the optical density values signals do correlate uh, with antibody levels in patient specimens, so you can at least come up with a semi-quantitative uh, indication of antibody level. Um, and again, as just diagrammed very simply here, um, the, uh, the wells of these plates can be coated with uh, various types of antigens, whether they spike or nucleocapsid, and patient serum is added, and then you have a conjugated uh, anti-human antibody that would we detect the presence of a binding to these antigens um, as the uh, test proceeds. So the other uh, platform uh, that we've done a lot of work with uh, here at the National Microbiology Lab are the plaque reduction neutralization tests and uh, the pseudovirus or surrogate assays. So the conventional neutralization assays uh, such as PRINTS are considered a gold standard um, for antibody detection due to their sensitivity and specificity, but the test does require specialized expertise training and because uh, the SARS-2 virus is uh, considered a level three agent, you have to do this work in containment with PAPRs and uh, appropriate uh, safety equipment. So this is not the easiest test to perform and the throughput is for low because of that. But the basic principle is to mix a set uh, concentration of live virus 
with dilutions of paste and sera and determine uh, neutralization titers based on the uh, inhibition or non-inhibition of plaques. Of course, you can set up other neutralization assays that use uh, CPE as an indicator, but this does provide us with a somewhat more precise manner, uh, method for determining titers. So uh, um, given the complexity of doing this test, only a number of labs uh, are, are using this uh, test here in Canada, although we've had have sent out neutralization panels to help standardize uh, some of these results, and we're uh, continuing to explore uh, this from uh, with regard to interlaboratory precision and reproducibility. But uh, the other generation of neutralization assays include surrogate assays that, um, if they are validated, and we're actually doing this, have advantages over the conventional prints because they be, can be used in level two containment and they have high throughput. So there's a number of in-house and commercial assays that are available. One I'll just uh, uh, profile very briefly is the GenScript CPAS, which basically uses a kind of a binding competitive ELISA newt uh, 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 format in which a new, if there's presence of neutralizing antibodies, it inhibits the ability of a conjugated re uh, receptor binding domain to um, connect with its uh, with the ACE2 receptor, and hence you can measure neutralization titers through this type of system. And then there's also the surrogate uh, viruses in which you uh, may use a platform such as VSV and replace uh, the uh, glycoprotein of that virus with the spike of coronavirus uh, or the SARS-2 virus, and then also use that in the same manner. Although again, that has some complexity associated with it as well. So when it comes down to uh, determining how well any of these platforms work, um, we feel that reference and proficiency panels really are key because the potential of a test is really assessed by its clinical sensitivity and specificity, and serological reference panels do give us uh, insights in determining performance characteristics involving sensitivity and specificity of both commercial and in-house serological platforms. Um, and as noted earlier in, uh, in our previous talks, the predictive value, though, of a test is influenced by the prevalence of virus infections in a population. So even even if a test has 99% sensitivity and 100% specificity or approaching that, you will have false positives when prevalence of uh, the virus is low and uh, due to uh, very low levels of viral circulation. So some of the panels that we have developed at the National Microbiology Lab uh, here in Winnipeg uh, do contain uh, uh, basically you know, a, a set number of various uh, key components, which of course includes zero from confirmed COVID-19 cases, pre-outbreak negative controls, and then other kinds of cross-reactive controls, including SARS-1, seasonal coronaviruses. Uh, uh, that particular uh, sera is very hard to come by, so we're hoping to obtain more of that, be open to any suggestions. Uh, and then other uh, 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 possible cross-reactive uh, materials such as zero from syphilis, HIV, and hepatitis. Um, the actual both composition and the number of samples that make up these re reference panels may vary to some degree, uh, depending on uh, the, uh, the institution that provides these recommendations. But uh, all in all, uh, they do line up fairly well. Health Canada, for example, has recently come up with uh, their uh, guide uh, with regard to uh, an evaluation panel in which 50 positive sera confirmed from confirmed cases collected 14 days post onset should be used, and then 100 to 200 negatives and pre outbreak controls as well. So, um, as mentioned, uh, our uh, colleagues at Health Canada have come up with some uh, standards or acceptance criteria, which include 95% sensitivity for IgM samples collected two weeks uh, post onset or greater and 98% specificity. But again, due to the challenges involving serology, they, they, there is some flexibility in that they've also provided lower limits or minimal standards of 90% and 95% respectively as well, just to give manufacturers uh, a little bit of wiggle room. But below those minimal standards, uh, they would not authorize or license these kits. So I just want to uh, provide you with a little bit of actual data. Uh, we've looked at, uh, uh, a total of 30 uh, kits 
that have come from uh, 22 companies. So in other words, a number of companies have, have provided us with uh, second generation or, or uh, somewhat evolved forms of their kits. And uh, as not, not surprisingly, sensitivity does trend upward with increased convalescence, but specificity may be sometimes compromised when you get this increased sensitivity. So very quickly, just to look at a couple of examples from, I'm just gonna call it company X, uh, involving a rapid test cassette. Again, you can see 65% sensitivity in the three to seven days uh, involving acute samples, and then it reaches over 90, 3% as we get uh, further along uh, after 14 to 21 days. Specificity can vary. The non-SARS, 82%, probably not the best, but uh, it even drops further with SARS-1, but SARS-1 may not be a, cons a, a major consideration due to its uh, non-existent circulation at this point. If we look at an example of an ELISA test kit involving IgG, again, it's the same trends. Uh, acute samples start off at uh, uh, 58% and then we'll go up to the mid 90s as you uh, uh, acquire or you look at more convalescent samples. And here we have better specificity involving non-SARS uh, samples. And uh, with SARS-1, this one really does cross-react. But again, that may not be a major issue uh, given the current epidemiological situation with SARS-1. So now I just wanna focus in very quickly on on plaque reduction neutralization and the cutoffs. They can very much influence final titers, whether you use a print 50 or print 90. That is, the you, a print 50 would be providing an endpoint at a dilution of the serum that still inhibits 50% of plaque formation versus print 90, which is more stringent. You require 90% inhibition. So if we look at a few panels here, and I'll just zero in on one, the SARS-237 uh, sample, you can see a print 50 titer 160 um, is quite good. Um, and you also get a positive result with print 90, but look at the fourfold difference, 160 versus 140. And you can see the same thing if you looked at the other panel involving, for example, the SARS-190 sample. Again, a print 50 gives a titer 180, but in this particular case, the print 90 is negative. With regard to specificity involving uh, our, uh, our, our print assays, pre-outbreak sera and so forth are certainly uh, uh, negative as well as HIV, hepatitis, and I can give you more examples. So the specificity again, it works well. Um, and we can say, although I don't have time to provide results, that some of the uh, receptor binding domain uh, 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 binding surrogate testers are very consistent with the print 50, not so much with the print 90. So uh, if we're comfortable with a print 50, then we obviously have a, a, you know, a high throughput commercial assay and other in-house assays uh, that do some, have a similar principle to go to. So I just wanted to again show you a little more raw data regarding some of the interesting results with um, print uh, cutoffs. And again, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's some key differences between print 50, print 90, even at the level of the actual plaque numbers. So I've just circled uh, uh, some data to kind of focus in on. So if you're looking at uh, this particular sample, we call it SARS-253, that you are seeing plaque breakthrough at 120, 140, but it uh, still makes the 50% endpoint cutoff. But if you're going over and looking at uh, it as a, from a, a print 90, you're, you're not going to uh, uh, show any kind of results. So in this case, you can see that uh, the sample would have a one in 40, but uh, a negative uh, result for, uh, for a print 90 cutoff. So this partial neutralization uh, that we see with plaques involving print 50 versus print 90 due to uh, uh, less of a cutoff stringency, um, you know, our determination are, are things that one may need to discuss or think about with regard to the type of neutralization assay uh, that uh, result that you're, um, you're using perhaps for uh, banking hyperimmune sera for therapeutics and so forth. I think at this point we're, we're okay with print 50s and maybe 160 titers, but I think again it warrants further uh, discussion and results. When we're talking about neutralization for potency, what's really happening at the antivirus binding or affinity, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, results, and uh, I think that uh, is are are there different antibody isotopes that are isotypes that are involved, 
and what are we really looking at with coreless immunity using this type of in vitro uh, 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 system or platform. Uh, I think, again, further studies warranted, and I know Dr. Neumeier talked about a lot of uh, the specifics involving epitopes and so forth. So I think more work to do to really interpret these uh, results in the manner that they, they need to be taken. So just want to go back to reference uh, panels uh, just briefly to end uh, the presentation. Um, and we know that reference panels can be heterogeneous due to the variation in the immune response observed, even in convalescent samples. Um, and the level of antibody or timing of a measurable isotope induced may be dependent on a number of factors. Again, the general convalescence of the sample. We know disease severity can contribute to the levels of antibody that may be present in the patient's sera. Uh, other things such as host genetics, maybe even underlying me medical conditions may all um, uh, be contributing factors. So, and we also know, as mentioned, that uh, uh, IGA, IGA, IgG, IgM isotopes may play distinct roles in neutralization at various times after infection. IgA might actually play a very important role early, and there's been some papers published on that. So, when it comes to sensitivity and specificity determinations, then obviously if your panel is made up of, 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 of uh, samples with heterogeneous um, uh, 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 degrees or levels of antibody, this will influence your sensitivity and your specificity versus a panel that may be made up of, from uh, various uh, you know, uh, individuals with uh, higher severity disease, and hence they're gonna have very high levels of antibody, hence any platform will provide a much higher sensitivity using that particular panel. So not all panels are created equal. So cross-validation studies play an important role in performance verification, and I think we really need to think about the utilization of robust, well-characterized pedigree serology reference panels when we are uh, assessing how well these particular platforms work. So conclusions very quickly. Uh, we know serology platforms are going to play, or are playing more important roles in sort of surveillance and immune, uh, immune science studies, um, but they do require ongoing performance characteristics and quality control. Um, the reference or proficiency panels are essential for both validation and QA ongoing, but not all panels are created equal and may influence sensitivity and specificity values that we see with a particular given kit or platform. Um, and I think the other thing that we need to consider is that there's recent observation in humoral immunity may wane after weeks or several months after infection, whether it's just binding antibody or neutralizing antibody. So other arms of the immune system, such as T-cell or cell-mediated immunity, may be playing a significant role. And so these types of assays are also in development and will also require some standardization and reference panels and validation criteria in the near future. Um, given uh, the, uh, the changing landscape with regard to COVID serology. So I just want to end by acknowledging my colleagues in our Zoonotic Disease Special Passings Laboratory here at the NML, Robin Lindsay, Heidi Wood, Antonio DiBernardo, and Melissa Mendoza, and other colleagues, as well as the Public Health Lab Network partners and other institutes that have provided us with the reference here, such as the Sunnybrook Health Science Centers and various partners across country. Um, and I really appreciate their help as we put together this assessment. And I'll stop there. Thanks again, and uh, I welcome any questions if there's time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, so I'll start with one from Sarah, Sarah Kempster. Given the antigenic drift described earlier, do you expect reference panels to be suitable for use globally, or will they be country specific? Hmm. Um, I would say that uh, this is something where we have to continue to monitor the quality of the uh, proficiency panel itself, um, because I think that is a concern. Um, one of the, the challenges even making up these reference panels is to get high volumes enough so that you can uh, uh, provide them uh, across the country and across other countries. So. Uh, I think, uh, yes, this is something that we do need to monitor and uh, maybe we need to have different kinds of panels as the pandemic evolves, just due to those types of changes that could be occurring. 
Thank you. Uh, we have one more here. Uh, we have seen many examples of the importance of samples from the pre-COVID-19 era. Is this a critical issue or are such patient samples readily available? Uh, I guess it depends on the, uh, where, where are you obtaining the sample set? Um, our pre-outbreak uh, samples uh, have come from a number of uh, different sources. And I think as was mentioned earlier, um, we need to look at these controls with regard to the possibility of seasonal coronavirus antibody being present, because we know that can cross react. We know that uh, individuals have been exposed to seasonal coronaviruses as a very a fairly common cold virus throughout the years. So, uh, so with regard to uh, the controls, um, yeah, they, they need to be evaluated. We need to also uh, develop uh, neutralization assays to determine if some of these control pre outbreaks here, uh, to what degree are there levels of antibodies to these seasonal coronaviruses, because they may influence the, uh, the, uh, the performance characteristics of the test. And I, I should bring up something uh, that I think is also important, and that is people that have been previously exposed to some of these seasonal coronas uh, may have uh, an antigenic sin or memory response uh, to them before they actually respond significantly to COVID-19. And we've seen this with other outbreaks involving related viruses such as dengue and Zika. So again, that's where interpretation is key and those complexities need to be, uh, uh, need to be understood and uh, documented. Yeah, uh, I think I saw Heinz had his hand up. Did you want to comment on that as well, Heinz? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for the two very, very nice presentations on the, on the immunology aspect of SARS-CoV-2. Um, we have also included um, samples from previously infected um, patients or problems, we must say, they were um, uh, analyzed to be to have been positive to 229E or to UC43, uh, um, uh, etc. Uh, in the EQA scheme we just finished, uh, we do not see such a, a, a huge cross-reactivity. We are quite astonished. Um, that uh, we did not did not recognize it, but uh, what has yet not been touched in, in in your talks was the aspect of IgA in our country in Germany. IgA diagnostics is quite heavily promoted. Uh, this has also something to do that one of the manufacturers has this test on the market. But I would like to ask you uh, when and, and at first give a comment. When I look at the IgG and IgM results, we have seen in the EQA scheme, we, of course, we, 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 we thought about the antigenic sin, but on the other hand, perhaps those tests on the market to detect IgA and IgM do not have the com a, a good sensitivity in comparison to the IgG test. And perhaps this could be a very trivial explanation why we have these unexpected time causes when we look at the different uh, uh, um, classes of, of immunoglobulins. What do you what do you say to this respect? Yeah, no, I agree, I, I agree with you. Um, and we have actually looked at that kit as well and looked at IgA. Um, and uh, we, we do not find the, uh, the sensitivity is, is somewhat lacking, but also there was a lot of specificity issues. So, uh, mm -hmm. so at this point, uh, uh, without naming the kit, <laughs> basically it has not been licensed or uh, um, uh, are basically approved for use in Canada, but we're continuing to work with, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the company and uh, just seeing whether or not uh, we can, uh, uh, you know, see whether or not there can be perhaps tweaking with the kit for uh, use in the future. Yeah, thank maybe, you. From, maybe from our side still um, there's an additional point. So we have seen the same thing. So the sensitivity of the IgA test was not really sufficient and not um, good enough. Uh, it was better than what we found for IgM though. The thing that you mentioned uh, regarding this uh, interesting different type of reactivity, I would just think that uh, it's a big problem uh, to discuss um, whether or not there should be such an early IgG response because uh, that's something usually takes time 
And if you have a patient that is just being diagnosed with an increasing uh, clinical course and just very early on in the infection, and you already have a high titers of IgG, that's something that's an interesting question that is, uh, could also, as I said, point towards the question whether or not you have some old memory B cells that are providing some um, reactivity that being revived and has been overtaken then by the IgM that comes later and evolves into IgG. So we're not quite sure what we're having there. If you look at all these different um, uh, viruses and the high homology, so there's also some uh, possibility that there are some less efficient memory B cells that are still around when you uh, finally encounter SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I, and in fact, I, I, I like the fact that you mentioned the, the possibility of, uh, of older memory cells being around that uh, are leading to this uh, observation. Um, and I think that uh, certainly warrants further study. We, we are coming towards the end of our time, gentlemen, uh, but we have a couple, few more questions. Uh, Jeremy, would you like to direct those? I think they were to Michael Neumeyer from earlier on. Uh, sure, I'll just put this out to the panel. Um, uh, do we have any information about the time evolution of the immune response after recovery from the, from the infection? Michael, you want to stop? stop oh. um, so the, the question is, uh, as, during recovery, what are we seeing with regard to immune response? Um, well, again, very recent studies have indicated that it seems to wane that uh, neutralization antibodies may drop in uh, a significant number of these individuals after uh, six weeks or seven weeks. Um, and uh, there's also, uh, I think, a, a concern here with regard to asymptomatic individuals, what kind of immune response they mount, and that may even uh, wane uh, uh, faster. So uh, I think uh, these, these studies point to the fact that uh, there may be a window in which um, humoral immunity may be very prominent, but then is there another arm of the immune system, as I mentioned, that hopefully takes over uh, with regard to protection? So maybe I'll pass it over to Michael for added comments. Yes, I completely agree. So what we see is that um, as you monitor the IgM and IgG as an early and, uh, versus late uh, immune response, we, we see within three weeks, we see the IgM really go down, followed by the IgG. So the IgG that we measure is um, also in decline. And I think at this particular moment, nobody has an idea on how long lasting any immunity would be. So that certainly is uh, something that has to be studied in much more detail and with much longer um, monitoring and follow up and also larger populations. I completely agree that the question is, um, in our case here, that people are going to be um, asked to get themselves immunotested. And so what we see is a huge increase in people that are so-called immune or have had uh, a previous encounter with the SARS-CoV-2, which is there's, there's a large discrepancy between the immune result and what we find actually from the nucleic acids testing. And, and I think it's really important if, if uh, in low prevalence areas, you have all of a sudden 17 times higher um, uh, numbers of uh, immunopositive people as, re uh, as uh, uh, compared to people that are really uh, being sick. And that really, and, but you cannot discuss away the people that die from Corona. So all of a sudden you don't have no more 5% mortality, you have 0.25% mortality. And we have had these discussions here that you are being asked, uh, so why should I keep my mask. Why should I keep social distance? It's like the flu. It's like the flu. It's it's nothing to to uh, to, to worry about. And so, therefore, I'm I'm really very very reluctant regarding um, uh, uh, recommendation of using antibodies at the, at the moment for testing asymptomatic populations. Uh, you're muted, oh. Jeremy. You're muted. Sorry, hi. Did you want to chime in on that? May, may I give a comment? And uh, uh, the, the point is, I think everything depends on the antigen that is, has been used when, 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 when setting up the test. 
from our recent EQA scheme, we see that we have very well characterized zebra from patients. We know when they were infected, that they have clinical signs. And then uh, we have results from, uh, I, I named the companies now because everything is in the internet, the Roche test, which detects IgG, IgA, and IgM positive, the Ebert test, which only detects uh, IgG positive. And then we come to the diazorin test detecting uh, IgG negative. And then we come to other tests also negative for the IgG. So um, it, 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 I think it burns down to the antigen they are using. At first, we would need some kind of standardization to understand what is a representative antigenic determinant? And therefore, I was so interested and I really liked all the, 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 the results, Michael, you presented on the neutralizing determinants because I think when I compare it to other uh, virus systems, like rubella, for instance, uh, we have to concentrate what is biologically, virologically uh, uh, important because at the moment, you know, in June or July 2020, we all know that we have a recent infection in case we have a positive result. But one year later, we have to, our duty will be to distinguish if this is a recent infection or a past infection. And therefore, I think uh, this is something we are all longing for to and, and I think to concentrate on the antigen and compare it with the biological activity of the corresponding determinant, that would help us a lot uh, to understand what's going on. Yeah, I would completely agree. On the other hand, as I said, um, for me, the question is what do you, what do you use the um, immuno testing for? And it's basically um, yeah. classic um, post-infection surveillance and uh, monitoring of herd immunity or whatever you call it. Um, so the thing is here that um, if you have too much, many false positives that you get a real big problem. And that unfortunately, as Michael was saying already, you may be approaching 100%, but it's a huge difference in, in, in predictive value, whether you have 99.8%, like is claimed by the Roche essay, which is ex what we find indeed, or if you have another test, which is 98.6%. So that makes a difference of a predictive value of 65% in some prevalence area as opposed to, let's say, 12%. And so the question, yeah. how, how do you give the, the, the result back to the patient? So you tell them, okay, you, your probability of being immune is one out of eight. So meaning eight positives, seven of them are, are false positive. People will not uh, take the risk and you have to uh, educate them because it's a risk assessment on behalf of every, every single patient or person that has been um, uh, tested. And I think it's a very important also task that we have as diagnostic uh, people in order to help people to understand test results. Can I, I stop you there? Uh -huh. I, I'm very interested in the discussion. I think that's going to uh, be a lot of food to thought for our community. I'd like to at this stage thank you all uh, for taking your time uh, to uh, uh, educate us in the work that you've been doing and some of the challenges that are faced and some of the challenges that will face us as our CCQM community uh, moves more deeply into this area. So I'd like to thank you and also I'd like to thank all the attendees. Uh, we had a, a large attendance, there was a lot of interest, almost 200 participants signed up for the community uh, to listen to this and we intend to come back in October, around October uh, and include some more of the activities actually happening in CCQM. So from me and from all our colleagues in CCKM, thank you very much for your time and thank you for all the information you've passed on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.